Scott Allen Miller, and this is my everyday life living in Nicaragua. I get a lot of questions from people who are anxious about moving to a new country and wondering what they need to do and, and have a lot of fears that need to be allayed or, or answered or addressed. And I wanted to put together this video partially because I need to run out to Managua tomorrow and I don't have a lot of time. I, we had a, we have a hurricane going on, um, and that's keeping me busy with the rain and flooding and, and travel planning is difficult because some roads close. Uh, so I thought this was a perfect opportunity to talk a little bit about why most people, a few will be exceptions, but why most people really don't have a lot to worry about when moving, especially to a place like Nicaragua, and of all places, why this is a great place to potentially start a journey of being an expat, and, and whether you have a family or you're on your own, uh, to explore the region or to explore the concept of being an expat. So let's dig into that right after the bump. Very importantly, right as we start, I want to acknowledge that absolutely everybody, well, before even that, I want to acknowledge that my shirt and my hat are oddly raspberry matched. That was completely an accident to the point where I think I'm going to go change my hat. Much better. Blueberry on top, raspberry below. I want to acknowledge that all people have different reasons for wanting to move abroad and different concerns as to why they may be worried about the entire process and have different limitations, especially people who are traveling with pets have some real severe complications and need to address a lot of their concerns differently than people who are a bit more flexible. That's one of the biggest, most common reasons why people have a need to do a severe amount of planning and have all of their possible questions asked ahead of time because moving with one or especially more pets is so difficult that it could create a problem where you're just not able uh, to, to do a lot of the flexible things that we're going to talk about. But for people who just have kids or just uh, a couple or just a single person, in most cases, especially if you're, you know, mobile and, and have any amount of financial resources, uh, you know, of course, some people are absolutely strapped and down to the very, very wire and need to plan every last dollar. You, special cases exist in lots of different ways. But a lot of people that I speak to have at least some amount of financial comfort, quite often very little, uh, maybe on very tight budgets that may be a driving factor as to why they're considering moving abroad at all, uh, maybe uh, looking for opportunities for their family or just adventure, it could be any number of things. People are driven by so many different reasons to consider becoming an expat and for people like me, adventure and this wanderlust and a craving of discovery. These were huge factors. Everything else was really minor. Of course, once I had kids, more reasons started piling on. I wanted to give them better life, more opportunity, uh, growth potential, exposure, uh, so many things, uh, safety and, and education. But um, even when I was young and single, I loved the idea of constantly moving and exploring. And while I didn't do a lot abroad, even within the United States where I grew up, I would constantly move to different cities, different states, different regions of the country, uh, constantly on the move, constantly exploring and constantly discovering because that was passion that drove me then and now, decades later, still drives me today and sharing that passion for exploring the world and discovering cultures and people and food and uh, terrain and everything else is something that makes me want to do this channel and help other people find their path to this discovery. Of course, I talk about finding your paradise, but for me, one of, the, of course, Nicaragua turned out to be my paradise location, but the process of finding it was so much, you know, they say it's the journey, not the, the destination. And it truly has been that the journey of getting to Nicaragua was so much of that wonderful adventure. And, and then luckily we had a great destination at the end, but we're hardly done. We're still going to be out and we still are right, regularly traveling and going to new parts of the country and to new countries and to new parts of other countries. And just that whole process is so wonderful. But so in talking to a lot of people, um, I get a lot of a very common set of concerns of, well, what if what if the country I go to isn't, you know, it doesn't have what I need? What, what do I need to do? What, why, why, why? What do I have to do to actually get to my first country? And 
And so I was talking to someone who was, who was looking at Europe and I said, Europe is so hard. Of course it can be done. People do it every day, but Europe has so many, uh, hoops to jump through, so many complications, so many delays. Uh, one of the reasons that Latin America has a tendency towards being really good for a lot of people when they're starting their journey into uh, becoming expats is that it is so much more accessible. It is closer for North Americans by flight. In some cases, it's closer by road. Uh, it's possible to go in extreme cases by boat. Uh, you have a lot of really doable options to get around Latin America. And many of the Latin probably most of the Latin American countries will allow you to simply show up and deal with anything you need to deal with once you're there. Very rarely do North Americans need to prepare before going most anywhere in Latin America. And uh, that's kind of special. Now, some of like Southeast Asia has some of those same benefits. There's places all around the world that in isolation have those benefits. Latin America has a really large region with uh, a great number of those benefits uh, throughout it. So, so it tends to give a lot of options in a single zone that, that very few other places do. So that, that's kind of a starting point. A lot of places like Southeast Asia that are incredibly welcoming are off-putting simply because of the incredible cost and logistics challenges of physically getting there. Of course, if you're a single traveler and you have plenty of money, it's just a long flight. But if you are a family and you want to go investigate and you have any reasonable uh, chance that you're, you're not going to want to be in that region, you're going to want to return, you have all this cost and complications of getting the whole family back again. And, and that can be that, that can become difficult. And some people have a hard time doing really long flights. I have lots of friends who are like, ooh, I, I couldn't reasonably go to Southeast Asia. Or I could if I had to, but I'm not going to do it for fun. It's too far. Um, whereas, like, I'm really good on long flights. To me, it's nothing. The cost is the only factor, and that's not that bad. But for a lot of people, it's nearly insurmountable. So those things can be big deals. Europe is quite a bit closer, but still quite a bit farther than most of Latin America. And Latin America can break up flights if you need to. So if you are looking at that, how do I get started? Well, one of the reasons that Nicaragua comes up so often as this, well, why don't you start here? And of course, I'm here. So <laughs> that's going to lead me to say that. But there are, uh, you know, a great number of places that would be absolutely wonderful. Mexico, for example. But if you wanted to move to Mexico, it is recommended, while not strictly required, for you to do some paperwork before you go. Nothing wrong with that. And as long as you know that that's where you want to go, go do that paperwork. Get things started. Get your butt in gear right now. Stop stalling on that. Get your passport. Talk to the Mexican embassy. Get your stuff rolling. Make it happen, right? Don't delay. Those things, those are your, your, uh, uh, your critical path, right? They're blocking issues. Make sure you have a passport. Make sure you, you're talking to the embassy and moving that stuff forward. Uh, but what if you don't know where you want to go? What if you're trying to just, ooh, I, I gotta break this, this, not traveling, not being an expat pattern that I'm stuck in. I stay home, I have a house, I'm paying a mortgage, I'm going to the office. I need to break that habit so that I can start learning, growing, adventuring. Right? Nicaragua, I often use as the example of you don't need anything. And I was speaking to someone today and I said, you know, one of the things, and we, we've said this on the channel before, one of the things that is really special about Nicaragua is Nicaragua, there's so much pressure from countries on the outside. Don't go to Nicaragua. Yeah, that's not a place you want to go. And, and Nicaragua is not focused on tourism. They're not going to go out and dump tons of money into it. Come to Nicaragua, enjoy our beaches. Come to Nicaragua, volcano surf, right? They're not going to do a bunch of that stuff. They're going to just let people discover it. Uh, or they do a little, but very little. They let people find them organically. But because Basically, no one comes to Nicaragua with this mental space of being like, well, I'm going to go to Nicaragua. My plan is not to return. Most people go to Nicaragua saying, I'm going to go to Costa Rica and then say, you know what? I get another country if I just cross over this border. I hear it's safe, so I'm just going to pop over and see what's going on. And then they go, well, I'm, okay, this is pretty cool. Let's go see a little bit more of it. And then someone says, you know, you don't have to leave. And they go, what did you say? And you're like, no, seriously, you don't have to leave. Like, just extend your visa, do a border run. Now you live here, right? Eventually get residency. But you don't have to tell anyone ahead of time. You don't have to plan for it. You don't have to file for a visa. You don't have to do anything. Just come to Nicaragua as a tourist and here on the ground 
as a tourist, after you've put in a bit of time as a tourist, maybe you'll want to go for residency. And that's fine. There's not only is there no penalty for doing it in that way, but it's the expectation. Everything is designed around you doing it that way. That you would ever do anything else isn't isn't like wrong, but it falls outside of every normal process. No one knows what to do with you because nobody does that, right? No one knows how to make that easy for you because it's not designed to work that way. Just come, spend some time, be patient, and, and work on residency if and when it makes sense. And so Nicaragua kind of has this mentality, if, if a country can have a mentality. It has a mentality of come visit, you'll not want to leave, guaranteed, or very likely. And, and people really do this. And so the way that Nicaragua attracts residents is by making it so easy to fall in love with the country and just decide not to leave. That that's like, that is the path, right? So few people are coming here predisposed to think that this is where they're going to want to be. But once you experience it, of course, there's people who come and are not interested in staying. But the number of people who discover it and say, wait, it is so much safer than I thought. It may not be so much cheaper, but it's cheaper than I thought. It's always cheaper than people think. And it's so friendly and it has so much to offer. And I just, and people just fall in love with Nicaragua. No one ever expects to fall in love with Nicaragua because they don't know what to expect. It's just the unexpected. And so you come here, you find that is the process. So because that's the process, Nicaragua is the ultimate location for someone who doesn't know where they need to go, who doesn't know what decisions to make. And you're, okay, so you're, you're living in St. Louis. You have a house, you have an office job, you have all these things, and you know you want to become an expat. You don't know where, you don't know when, you don't have the answers, but you know this is a thing you at least want to try. The thing that is so hard is getting past the barrier of being in, in whatever your home country is. you got to get to that point where you're like, okay, I sold my stuff. I switch to an income source that is, that is flexible, um, or I have a plan for one or whatever, and you know, I, I, I've sold my things, I sold my house, and I'm ready to, to go down to a few suitcases, whether it's just me or me and my whole family. For me, it was, you know, my wife and I and our two kids. We went down to 11 suitcases. Foolishly, we kept a storage unit uh, for way too much stuff, which we are still dealing with. We've lost easily $10,000 because of that. Please don't make my mistakes. I try, to, I try to tell people, right, just because I made those mistakes, one of the reasons I have this channel is to stop you from making the same mistakes. <laughs> now, we, we were really confident we wanted to become expats and wanted to stay expats. So the storage unit was incredibly foolish, but we were like, ah, it was, it's only $100 a month. Ah, we'll be able to keep so much stuff. Ah, we'll, we'll come and use it from time to time. Every bit of, thing of that was wrong. It's almost $300 a month now. We've never managed to get to it and get anything in or out of it in all these years. So it's, it's completely a black box. We don't remember what's in there. We do know that when we open it up, we can't get into it. There's so much stuff packed in there that it's Unaccess it's inaccessible. We have to take it all out. And there isn't enough time in a day to do that. And we've gotten older, like we're four years older than when we put stuff in. In some cases, six years older than when we put things in there. And so like my back was able to handle loading it six years ago. Now I can put in a few hours, but an eight hour day of loading and unloading heavy furniture, it'll give out and I won't be able to get the last things back in. We won't be able to close the door. We have to have a crew go with us. And that means we have to have trucks to load everything on and somewhere to take it all when we're done. Like we cannot use the storage unit. We, we backed ourselves into a corner with it. And so that is something we're looking at dealing with, right? That was a mistake. Don't, don't make that mistake unless you really know you need a storage unit and really think, really, really think you will always need less than you have. But we knew, long ago that we wanted to move from place to place, test things out. We didn't want to be making a final decision. And we went down to 11 suitcases for four people. It's not terrible. And uh, that's less than three per person. Uh, and, uh, and we moved and just started exploring. Nicaragua, if you don't know where you want to go, is such a great starting point. And here's why. One, like I said, it's so easy. None of that stuff that you might need to prepare for in another country do you need to prepare for here. There's no medical stuff that you need to deal with. There's no visas. This is for North Americans and Europeans at least. There's no visas or anything that you need to deal with. 
You don't have to worry about how long you're going to be here. Now, you know, someone just wrote to me, they're coming from India. Someone always writes me, they're coming from Africa. Yes, if you're coming from farther afield, if you're not coming from Latin America, Europe, North America, maybe Australia, New Zealand, there's a possibility that you have bad visas and then it's going to be some other country that's better for you. And that's unfortunate. I wish that I could say Nicaragua was equally great and one set of rules for everybody, but nowhere is. And I, I know of no country in the world that's like that. Uh, I wish they all were. Right. But that's wishing does not make anything come true. And, uh, so, so from almost everywhere that my audience is, your ability to come to Nicaragua is simply get on a plane, show up. That's it. Make sure you have the things you need in your luggage. You don't even have to deal with money or anything, right? You can use us dollars here. You can use the ATMs here. You can take out us dollars. You can take out the local currency. Um, like there's, it doesn't get, it truly doesn't get simpler. And we're gonna do another video coming up pretty soon um, about the, the opinion, because my wife just said this and I say it a lot, but she doesn't say it because I said it. She would never do that. Um, <laughs> if anything, she would stop saying it if she knew I said it. But the thing is, is that we, we often say it is easier to move to Nicaragua than it is to continue living in the United States. For us, that is 100% true. For a lot of people, that's true. Not for everyone, but for so many people. I want to do a quick shout out to Jenny Alexander, who I went to high school with, and she commented on, uh, on, on the show a few days ago. So this is very funny. We went to high school together. We grew up down the street from each other. Yeah, pretty far, probably 20 houses apart. It was a long bike ride, but I used to bike to her house quite a lot. She lived more or less across the street from the high school that I went to. Um, and uh, we were super close in high school. And importantly, we went to Spanish class together. We did a lot of classes. Like she was, one of the people, she might be the person who was in more classes with me than anyone else in high school. So we had a lot of academic overlap and a lot of like interest. We were in a lot of clubs together, tons of clubs together. Uh, and then after high school, we were in a band together for 10 years. Uh, so we, huge amount of time. We're super close friends. Um, but we haven't talked much, uh, for the last 16 years. Like, uh, she was at my wedding. I was, you know, but, but a few years after that, we moved away and, you know, when you get older, you lose contact with, not contact, but you stop having regular contact with most people. Back home is just, you know, a ton of, hey, what are you up to this week? Hey, that's cool. Right. And you, you don't really keep catching up. But when you need to connect for something, you're like, yeah, of course, you know, we have no reason not to talk to each other. It's just, we don't have things to talk about. And under most cases, it's, you know, watch people's Instagram feeds to keep up or whatever. But she sent me this note and, and had this funny story that uh, she's dating someone who's actually from Leon and, and he told her, oh, I found this guy. So he's been trying to talk her into move to Nicaragua. And she's like, that sounds cool, but I'm not 100% sure. And he showed her, he's like, you know, so there's this guy from, from Rochester, New York, uh, and he knew she was from Rochester, New York, which is funny because neither of us are actually from Rochester. I mean, I was born there, but we both grew up out in the country an hour outside of Rochester. Um, and so everyone from the show just knows me as being from Rochester because it's the city where I was born. So he's like, this guy's from, you know, the general area you're from. You gotta check him out because he's in Leon, Nicaragua and he shows a lot of it. I think it will help you feel comfortable with moving to Nicaragua. And she, she watched it and she's like, what? <laughs> like, it's Scott? What? So she sent me a note and she's like, okay, this is hilarious. So they've already bought a place here and they're on the same street that we are basically, right? Right, like closer than we grew up going to high school together. And uh, uh, so she's going to be here in like two weeks, three weeks, I think, uh, for her first visit. I don't know if I'm going to get to overlap because I have to be in Bolivia. But really funny. So they're in the process of moving down. And she's like, once I saw your show and it was you, she's like, that seals it. Because it's not just I'm now comfortable with Nicaragua because it's someone she knows and trusts. But also she's like, we'll have a community. Like, these are our friends. You know, she knows me. She knows my wife. She knows my kids. Um, and uh, even though we haven't seen her in a long time, this is really easy for her to just move. And be done. <laughs> it'll be like, oh, back at high school with high school friends. So very, very, very funny uh, situation. So I just wanted to share that because that's a great story. Right. But, um, so, so coming to Nicaragua because you don't need anything and because the country is very inexpensive, right at that, like given the cost of flights and stuff, basically nowhere is cheaper. And it's certainly cheaper than staying wherever you're coming from. And it's incredibly safe almost guaranteed to be safer than wherever you're coming from and basically guaranteed to be safer than anywhere else you're seriously considering going, at least in the, in the general region. 
Those things alone give you so much. How could you be worried, right? What can go wrong? You can end up completely not liking it. That's fair. You hate the heat. I've had people not like the heat. You don't like the gym culture.、I've、had people not like the gym culture. Maybe you don't like the the litter. They're working on that, but it's still an issue. It's not fixed yet. Some people, that's what they don't like. Everybody has something, but no one comes and is in danger. It's you're here, you're safe, it's cheap. You're not bleeding out money. Of all places, you're not going to bleed out money here. You're not in physical danger. You can stay. Almost everyone is so capable of just. Staying, the chances that you would fall through a crack and be in a situation where you didn't qualify to be able to stay. Maybe you have to do some paperwork at some point. Maybe you don't. Maybe it's a little bit of effort. Maybe it's not. I'm not saying that you don't have to do anything, but you come. And I've never really met anyone from North America or Europe that came and didn't have at least a year and a half before needing to have a discussion. And at that point, everyone's in a position to. Choose whether they're going to stay or not. If they want to stay, they'll find a way, right? Like a way has been presented. I've never known anyone who didn't get to stay if that's what they decided they wanted to do. Some people are like, "Well, I wanted to be here for a year, but that's it. I want to move on," and that's fine. But it's in my experience, and of course there are exceptions, but they are so rare. I have never encountered those people who've come and. Of course, you know I know people who've committed crime. Like I've heard of people who committed crimes and they weren't allowed to stay. Obviously, that happened. That's completely different. But of people who actually come and are just wanting to stay, I've never heard of a situation where someone actually wasn't able to find a way to stay. And I actually don't know anyone who had it be hard. Right? It's always been yes and relatively easy. So, almost guaranteed, you will get to stay. And even if you can't, you can probably stay quite a long time. You may have a year; it could be years potentially that you get to stay and figure out where you're going next. So you get lots of breathing room. So all these things come together that your degree of comfort should be. And I totally understand going to a new country for most people is just gonna be scary. It's your first time being an expat, gonna be scary, right? Those things can't be just whisked away. But you can choose a place where every factor that you can control isn't bad. It's basically the best case scenario. Nicaragua, one of the reasons that we live here, not the primary one, but a reason that we ended up in Nicaragua is definitely because it is so good in these areas. We want a place that's safe. We want a place that's inexpensive, and we want a place that is welcoming and makes it that we had a high degree, extremely high degree, of confidence that we would be able to. Actually, make a life here without any complications. Now, I'm not worried if I needed to make that same decision in Mexico, Argentina, Colombia, Guatemala, Peru, Paraguay, Uruguay, Brazil. I am sure in all of those countries and many others in Latin America alone that I would be able to find a path to permanent residency and/or citizenship. Basically, all of them, even Bolivia, which is quite challenging. I would be able to do that. I could pull it off. It may take planning, money, time, any number of things. Hassle, of course. But in all of them, if that's where I decided to go, should be doable. Really, don't have to worry. Most of Europe, the same. Harder, but doable. There's a path forward in most cases, at least at least for us. And、uh, but Nicaragua. Is so welcoming, so easy, and so reliable that even before you originally come, it's one of the countries where you can say, "I've made a decision. This is where I want to go. I could be wrong, but I'm. I want to be the one who's wrong. If there's going to be a mistake, I want it to be mine. Not I went to X country. I put in all this effort. I fell in love, and then found out they didn't want me. Right? Nicaragua is not that place." You will know if there's something that is going to potentially make you not eligible to stay. You already know, right? It would be something really extreme. You have absolutely no income. You have a serious criminal record. You plan on doing things that are super criminal, right? And in the last case, just don't do them. If you really want to stay, just don't be a criminal.、Right? Like you control that. So 
Nicaragua gives you this confidence in all these areas. So I think Nicaragua is this amazing starting point for most people. It doesn't mean that I'm, that I'm not trying to tell you that Nicaragua is the right place for you permanently. I have no idea. For a lot of you, just because you're watching my channel and Nicaragua is our topic, yeah, for many of you, Nicaragua is the, going to be the right choice. But that's because you've already self-selected that. But for the, the random person that I may be speaking to who's popping into this video and saying, well, where should I start? I want to be an expat. What's this Nicaragua deal? The chances that Nicaragua is going to be your permanent choice, mm, middling to low. No single country is going to be anybody's average good, right? Like there's no country that takes most people. There's some that take more people like Mexico, but nobody takes the majority. That doesn't exist. So no matter what country you're looking at, the chances that most people will go there, no. But of countries that we could list, Nicaragua is one of the most likely, if you actually try it out, for it to work for you. And it is simply at the very, very, very top of the least to go wrong, the easiest and most reliable to do it, and leaves you with the most choices once you're here. You don't want to go to your first country, fall in love, and, just, and find out you don't get to stay. That would be kind of awful uh, with Nicaragua. You know that you're, if you don't like it, it's easy to move on, and if you do like it, it's easy to stay until such time as it doesn't make sense for you anymore. And if it makes sense for forever, the chances that you can is basically guaranteed. But this leads me to another region that I wanted to talk about. Now, I want to say real quickly, Southeast Asia, there's generally ways to get to stay in Southeast Asia as well. A little bit more work, a little bit more research, but really, really simple. And there's some little quirks to Nicaragua that you need to know. We have all that in our videos. If, if you decide that you do want to come to Nicaragua, one, just get down there and ask your questions in the comments below. Hop on our live stream on Thursdays, ask your questions live, email me, scott at latinamericanliving.com. Like there's a lot of ways to reach out and, and get little things answered, but everything's all in our videos too, so just watch those and you'll be fine, right? So, but there's, it's not nothing to know, but it's all stuff you don't have to know until you've been here for a while, right? You've been here for, oh, you've been here for, five, for three months? What do I do? Uh, you need to get an extension. Oh gosh. Okay, I've done all my extensions. What do I do? You have to do a border run. Easy peasy. Okay, but you got to have someone to ask those questions of. I understand. Going to Southeast Asia, you're basically in the same boat. Could you stay in SE Asia for years without doing any paperwork? You certainly can. Are there a few tricks you need to know? Of course there are. Not a big deal, and there's lots of people who know exactly how to do them. A little bit of research. But I used to live in Europe for a very long time, and in doing so, one of the things that I discovered was that if you want to stay in Europe, you can. And here is the example, because I was speaking with someone and they're like, well, we wanted to go to Europe. We had a bunch of areas we were really interested in, and I totally get it. Europe is awesome, and there's a lot of reasons why that might be the region where you want to end up. But if you don't have a specific spot picked out, or even if you do, but you don't have a path or an easy path to permanency, that can be frustrating. Maybe you pick Spain, we did, and you absolutely fall in love and you're like, I have to be in Spain. That needs to be my place. Well, Spain may or may not let you stay. If you do nothing, they won't. They'll give you three months and that's it. Uh, so that's very depressing and they don't let you do a border run. This is a very large region that is highly desirable and does not have border runs. That's almost unique. Most places allow border runs. So uh, that you have these this really strong limitation over this huge area because it's the Schengen zone. It's basically all of Europe makes it a bit more complicated. But there are still travelers tricks or hacks or whatever that you need to know. And this can be a little bit creative and think outside the box. We have some videos. We, I mentioned that a lot, right? If we think outside the box and, and, and take a slightly different tact on this, I think you may be even comfortable moving to Europe, even if you don't have residency or a clear path forward to get it at the time that you first go. Part of my whole thing is simply don't stall waiting on paperwork unless you absolutely have to. Get out there, become an expat. You're going to grow. The world is going to change. For all you know, you're going to end up with a path to residency that you didn't expect. You're, you're not in a good position to make good things happen if you don't get out there and just start making things happen, right? Does that make sense? So I want everyone to kind of approach this of, can I simply make it happen? So in this case, the person I was talking to has a large family, but 
no pets and generally they're pretty flexible. So let's talk about this. What if they wanted to go to Spain? Well, like us, when we went to Spain, we had no path to residency. That gave us 90 days and that was it. So we moved into Spain. We had all of our possessions with us, minus the really annoying uh, and might as well have thrown it all away storage unit that I mentioned. Uh, and living in Spain, we went for our 90 days and that was amazing. And then all we had to do is move on to another country that isn't in the Schengen. So Portugal, France, they don't count. So we have some options. For us, we ended up coming back to Latin America and, and using that instead of some other place in Europe. But there's lots of wonderful places in Europe that are not part of the Schengen. And not as many as there used to be as Romania and Bulgaria, I was just informed, joined the Schengen zone this year. So two of my favorite places to use as an alternative are no longer an alternative. So that's a big negative uh, for me personally, because bouncing between Spain and Romania would be absolutely wonderful, but you can't do that anymore. But if you were in Spain after 90 days, you can go to places like Albania, uh, Serbia, Bosnia, uh, Kosovo, um, any Macedonia, uh, any number of, of alternative locations. And those are just the ones in mainland Europe. There's the less European European countries, right? Georgia, Armenia, they're sometimes considered European, sometimes not, whatever, but they will also count. You also have lots of wonderful southern Mediterranean options, Morocco, Algeria, uh, Tunis, um, uh, like there's options, right? And these are just the ones that are super close, like you're going by ferry or by train or whatever. If you're willing to get on a plane, you can go pretty much anywhere. You have Africa, Asia, Latin America, you know, North America, you have so many places that you could go for those other 90 days. So it all comes down to what you want to do. We were willing to go a little bit farther because we were exploring the world and trying to make sure we were going through all the options. But if you want to stay in Europe, which is totally reasonable, you don't want to go far, then going someplace that you can easily get to and from by train may make it really easy for you to spend 90 days in the place that you want to be in Spain, for example, and 90 days in another place that you really like. Maybe it's not your first choice, I understand but you're only going for 90 days in that place and then you're able to go back to Spain. So let's just say Albania, that was one that was on my video uh, just last uh, last few days about the 10 alternative countries that you should consider. For expats, Albania is super welcoming and generally gives you, I believe, a year, not 90 days. So if you go and for any reason you need extra flexibility or you need to be there 92 days, no problem because Albania will let you stay really long every time you come. And so you go to Albania, now you could just rent apartments and both places. You could buy houses in both places, right? It depends on your budget, what you want to do, how certain you are that uh, you want to be in a specific spot. But both of these countries are really inexpensive or can be if you're on a budget and trying to make them inexpensive. You could really easily end up just bouncing back and forth between two countries and have stability that it's this our winter house, our summer house, our spring house, our fall house, and just go back and forth if you just want stability. Or you could use Spain as a base and then every 90 days go explore a new country and then come back to Spain. That's what we actually thought we were going to do for a long period of time. We really fell in love with Spain, but we ended up never quite getting the itch to go back as much as we wanted to go to a new place. So we kept not going back and just kept exploring. But at some point, our plan, unless we found a place we liked as much or better, was to get a permanent home in Spain and then every 90 days bounce to a new place every 90 days come back to Spain and have our, our permanent home where we would be half the year but broken up and then other places the rest of the time. That's not exactly what ended up working out. We ended up picking Nicaragua as our location instead of Spain and we ended up uh, kind of just falling into a pattern of we really like it here and Nicaragua gave us the option of never needing to leave ever, ever, ever. Uh, and while we love to explore the world, and I do for business all the time, we don't travel the, uh, away from our home base six months of the year like we originally planned, partially because we ended up with pets because of during the COVID era, we just ended up adopting animals. Life throws curveballs at you. Things change all the time. So now we're a lot more permanent in Nicaragua than we had anticipated, but the theory holds. And we did it for a really long time that you can just bounce from place to place. And once you start, you're flexible. So you don't have to feel like you have to make this big decision, right? So for us, we got to Spain. We put in our first 90 days. It was absolutely wonderful. Then we moved on to other places and we just kept saying, oh, there's this next place I really want to go to. And we just kept going to new places 
We never got to a point that we gave up that wanderlust and excitement of the next place. But the moment we would have, we could have gone back to any place that we had been to. We could, we could stop and say, okay, here's the places we've lived. Which one do we want to go back to? Which one do we want to make permanent? And we could have. And I guess we did. Nicaragua was that place. We lived in Nicaragua in 2015. I visited again in 2019. Immediately within a week or two of that 2019 trip, we made the decision that that was going to be our permanent home and immediately began the move down. COVID hit and it delayed us a little bit, but that decision was made about four years after our initial time of having lived here. We left uh, at the end of 2015 and about fall of 2019, maybe, yeah, I think it was late fall 2019, I was here and said, you know what, Nicaragua is the place I would never have guessed but actually makes sense. And we thought to be a home base from which we would do a lot of living abroad. And then once we were here, felt really comfortable being a bit more settled. Um, and, and the reality is, is for us, we found that settling in a new place, in, in a foreign country, still feels like we're traveling all the time. Now, after several years here, it feels a lot less like we're traveling. It feels a lot more like home. And that's why we're starting to travel again more and more. The first few years, it really felt like we were just long-term travelers and, and still very exotic. Now, this feels like home. Going back to the United States feels exotic and weird. And uh, um, so, just this past year, I was in 11 countries. I didn't spend six months in them, but I did spend quite a bit of time. We, we, we put in a bit of time in Mexico, a bit of time in Argentina, a bit of time in Bolivia, um, and then little bits other places. Well, a fair amount in the United States as well. So, uh, the thing that I really wanted to convey on this video was that your ability to get out and start exploring the world, for most of you, there's going to be exceptions, but for the almost all, at least 8 out of 10, easily 9 out of 10 of my viewers, when you're saying, but I, I, I'm worried, I'm scared, I have, totally understand, most people are, it's a big move, but it doesn't have to be as big as you think. It, it isn't, and once you do it, you'll understand. Wow, that was so easy, especially coming to like Nicaragua. Yeah, you want to go to some really complicated place, some really hard to get, you want to move to Switzerland, that's going to be a lot of work. Planning, money, time, effort, yeah, huge. There's places that are hard to move to, but just becoming an expat and living abroad in a place that's affordable and safe and interesting and fun, not hard. So easy that I cannot possibly explain how easy it is. Uh, and so that's the, that's the theme, right? If you know you want to become an expat, you want your family to move abroad, make it happen. Make it happen now. Put that into motion. You know, once you know you want to do it, sure, you may have blockers at home. Uh, we're pregnant, we're gonna have a baby, we don't have a baby while we're traveling. Understood. Uh, oh, I've got this work thing I've gotta wrap up. I've got a house I've gotta sell. Understood. Completely makes sense. Do what needs to be done to get the things done. Get the passports. File any paperwork. Start selling the house. Start selling your things. Stop investing in, in, in being mired in wherever you are and start investing in being free, right? Sell off your stuff. Have a garage sale. Stop buying things you don't need. Get the luggage. Make sure everything's mobile. For me, it was getting smaller laptops that were easier and more portable, batteries that lasted longer, more, uh, you know, smaller cameras and, uh, you know, just getting down to everything being much more portable and, and getting rid of collectible things that I have no reason to own. That was a tough move. It took time, but we did that. And once we did it, we were so free and flexible. So start those things as fast as you can. Take anything that's going to be a blocker, knock it out. And if you're waiting for a, another blocker, like you, you have to wait for something to mature at work or an investment to finish up or, a, you know, you're, you're six months out from retirement. Obviously, don't throw that away. Get there, right? But make sure everything else is done. Make sure that the day that happens, you're like, okay, and I'm out. Everything's done. That was my last blocker. Don't let there be a lingering thing because you pushed it off. And, and use any extra time to do a little extra planning. Watch some extra videos. Maybe take a trip and do some scouting. Uh, you know, sell off even more things. Really figure out, how, pack your bags over and over again. Figure out how to get it really tiny. All kinds of things, right? So that, uh, and, and, and don't be afraid. Remember, 
you move out, you can just move back. You're not giving up citizenship or right to live anywhere you're coming from. You're going on vacation and you're just hoping not to come back. Maybe you are hoping to come back, right? Would you be afraid if I said, hey, come to, come to Panama this weekend for a weekend trip. Let's go fishing. Let's go have a beer. You wouldn't be afraid of that in most cases. You'd be like, that sounds cool. Fishing and a beer in Panama? Yeah, that sounds pretty cool. What's a flight? 200 bucks? All right, let's go. And then what if I said, okay, now that you're here, stay for 90 days. Stay for 180 days in Panama, right? Just stay for half a year. Oh, well, I'm already here. I guess, yeah, that's not scary. I'm just taking this weekend trip that wasn't scary at all and extending it to six months. Wow. Of course, if you have a job you'd lose, that would be scary. If you have a house that is going to fall down and you got to keep it, that would be scary. But if you sold those things and you're just footloose and fancy free on vacation, you you come down. What is scary about having a longer vacation? Nothing. And that's a mental barrier. Get past that mental barrier. But uh, that example with Europe is so important because even the places that are hard are often not as hard. If you're willing to be flexible, often there's just a way to do it. People do this every day. Backpackers are out there doing it all over the world all the time. And I know they're not the lifestyle most of you are looking for. But there's ways to do this in every budget, every lifestyle class, every everything, right? You have a way to do this probably today. And I encourage you to just start because once you get to your first country, once you become an expat, you're going to learn so many things about being an expat, about your taxes, about packing, about moving to a new country so quickly. And at the same time, you're going to learn so much about yourself. You're going to figure out what you like, what scares you. You're going to almost certainly lose that mental barrier. You're going to have confidence in being able to go to a new place. And of course, the obvious, you're going to learn about a new place. So you come to Nicaragua. Now you know about Nicaragua. Maybe you fall in love. You're like, I never need to see another place. But what if you go to another place? Now you're going to learn about that place and build up that repertoire of now I, now I have this confidence. Now I have processes. Now I have good luggage and I know how to pack it. Now I know all about power adapters for different countries. Like you're going to get little skills all the time. And pretty soon you're going to just be like, this is, this is easy. I can go almost anywhere, almost anytime. And if I have to, I can return. I have so much flexibility. So many people, when they're trying to scare you from being an expat, they'll say things like, well, the United States government, it's always the US, right? It's always the US in the scary example. The US is just going to cut you off. I bet. I bet expats, they're going to they're gonna get you. Really? Because the American government doesn't have the ability to define expats. I mean, they can say what the word means, but they don't know if you're an expat. They literally don't. You're just an American on vacation. And they're not going to go after affluent Americans. The degree to which this is not possible is so extreme. It's such an implausible thing. But people are jealous of people who become expats and the things that they will say are crazy. But it does stir this fear. It helps feed this, this thought that maybe there's something that you're missing. That it's just people trying to ruin your life because they're sad themselves or they're scared of the world and they don't want other people to get benefits that they can't get because they're scared, right? So they want you to be scared too. That's all that's going on. But there's no chance that you will ever not be able to return to your country. Like that's the great thing. You are a citizen of wherever you came from, right? U.S. is the example that everyone always says, you know, something bad will happen. We're going to get those expats, but they don't realize that expat is something you define about yourself. I've decided to live abroad. Like you just took your vacation and decided to make it into expatting, right? It's a very soft thing. I understand that the government can say, oh, you are outside the country, therefore you're an expat, but Nearly every American is outside the country at some point, whether for work or for investing, whether working on behalf of the government or working uh, for your own reasons or out for an NGO or on a missions trip or you name it, right? And can you imagine the United States government saying, ah, missionaries, we're going to get them? No, of course they're not. Or you can say, oh, American business people, we're going to show them. No, of course they're not, right? It doesn't matter what, what government organization you think is going to be involved in the future, currently, anything, none of them say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to get those people making money. They don't say that. They never have said that. They're never going to say that. That makes no sense. And I know, I know that people will make this crazy argument. Well, the government makes no sense. 
okay. But you're really grasping at straws to try to make some fear that doesn't actually exist. In reality, few things protect you more than being an expat. Yes, being a billionaire protects you more than being an expat. But you know what most billionaires are? Expats. Because they know that that's an additional level of power in their lives. So, one of the things that you can't control is being a billionaire. But one of the things you can control is being an expat. And that is a really powerful place that should, and once you do it, you will realize that the power of being an expat is that you have the power to go anywhere. You have the mental space to be comfortable all around the world. You have so many options. And of course, the Americans, the Canadians, the, the British, the, the Germans who have never traveled still have all these powers. They're just not leveraging them. They're not opting to use them. So their own fear or lack of knowledge or experience is holding them back. You can simply pull the trigger, overcome that, and have this world of options that includes at any moment snapping your fingers, more or less, buying a plane ticket, going back home, and yes, you're coming back, you don't own a house, you don't have all these things, you're, you're living like an expat back home with very few possessions, you want to get a small apartment, whatever, I understand, may not be the ideal situation going back home, but you can go back home as if you never really left to anywhere in the, you know, wherever you came from, you can just go back. Knowing that it's so easy to just go back is something that is, it, that's a big mental barrier. People really forget that in no way are they burning bridges whatsoever. There is no country that treats you having left to go live abroad in a negative way, except for like, maybe North Korea, maybe some places that are in the middle of a war and drafting people. There's really isolated exceptions. No reasonable place. No one watching this channel is in a position or will be in a position where has any possibility ever remotely of being in a position where becoming an expat has any possibility of negative ramifications to the point of that it can't possibly not have guaranteed positive ramifications. Not just abroad, but back home. The benefits of being an expat is so extreme. The ease of becoming one is so extreme. But everybody wants you to think it's hard. Whether it's the people back home who are jealous or the people who are already expats and want to sell you services because they want you to be afraid and be like, oh, I gotta, I gotta pay these people $500 to, to help me move. I get, no, it is easy. It is safe. It's functional. Yes, you gotta pick the right places to go. Come to Nicaragua, go to Spain. Go to Thailand, some places that is easy, some places that, that is tried and true, some places that you have resources, some places where you know you can get on the ground, get at least 90 days, 180 here, no question, plus the border runs, you can just stay indefinitely. One way or another, you'll be able to stay in Nicaragua. Go to a place where you can make that expat leap. It will open your world to you, and then from there, make your decisions. But a little bit of thinking outside the box. It'll solve everything. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you would be so kind as to leave a comment, say hello, or ask a question, or there's directions in the, in the show notes about how you can send in a video and be on the show with me, that'd be fantastic. If you'd like to sponsor us, uh, we do have a join button for a membership. That's $5 a month, and it's just supporting the show. We do have a private chat group, but really it's just about supporting the show. Or you can do a one-time sponsorship with the link that we'll put up, Buy Me a Coffee, at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. That's like Patreon uh, and allows you to just send a thank you for uh, the work that we do here. We have to pay for the cameras and the software editing and all the things it did takes quite a bit to make a show like this every day. We actually pump out three a day and uh, most of them are shorts, but the it's a lot of content. It really is. And uh, I so much appreciate everyone who watches and everyone who supports. And of course, watching another episode, hitting that like button, those things all help. Leaving comments helps. All those things promote the channel. So even if you just let some videos run when you're, when you're doing other things and it's on in the background and you put it on a TV somewhere, all of that helps. So thank you so much to everyone who puts in an effort to make that possible. And uh, I will see all of you tomorrow. <laughs>